Hi there. How you doing today? You doing all right? Great. Today we're going to talk about a topic that I feel like might be a little boring sounding, but I don't think it is. Okay. I think it's interesting and I think I have a lot to say on it. And so I'm making a whole video on it. Basically, this is spurring from last week, Darrell E. Brooks, the perpetrator behind the Christmas parade attack in Waukesha, the one that killed six people and wounded dozens of others. He was found guilty on 76 counts, including 61 counts of recklessly endangering the safety of others, six counts of a hit and run causing death, two counts of bail jumping, and one count of misdemeanor battery. And they carry a mandatory minimum of life in prison. His conviction comes after what was truly a circus like three week trial during which he acted pro se, meaning he defended himself. He was given attorneys because under the sixth amendment, you are guaranteed the right to counsel in a criminal trial. And if you can't afford one, they'll be assigned to you from the public defender's office. He had them, he fired them, and he willingly became a pro se litigant. That's what you call someone who chooses to represent themselves in court. And his trial gained national attention mainly for his antics in the courtroom. First of all, he was making claims that the court didn't have jurisdiction over him because he's a sovereign citizen. If you don't know, sovereign citizens are a group of people that believe themselves to be above the law and outside the jurisdiction of the United States. They also seem to think that the law is just some like magic fairy dust where if you say the right combo of words, like you don't have personal jurisdiction over me, then you get off scot-free. The trial also gained national attention because of Brooks's absolutely unhinged behavior while he was representing himself. He was removed on a daily basis from the courtroom for being disrespectful, being disruptive. And he was put into a separate room where the judge could mute him. And he was given these cards to use that said like objection in order to signal when he objected. The judge is named Jennifer Doro. And by all accounts, she managed the case with as much poise and decorum as humanly possible. Like very impressive, good for her. I'm sure she is absolutely relieved to be done with this case. So I wanted to use this case as an opportunity to look at pro se litigants and the theory behind why people are allowed to represent themselves and then what that actually looks like in practice based both on my own anecdotal experiences as well as some data and statistics and studies and stuff that I got my little grubby hands on, all right? And I think this matters because it's important to point out that the Brooks trial while entertaining was not the status quo. And also it's a good opportunity to examine the safeguards that our judicial system has in place to give people a voice and where those safeguards sometimes or frequently fall short. Because if you have a country that fails to teach its people legal literacy, like this one, then you have the result of Dorelli Brooks's of the world, you know what I mean? So let's get into it, roll the intro. gonna go into every strange antic that happened during the Brooks trial because frankly this would become a feature length film and I ain't got the time, okay? But here are some highlights, just to give you an idea of what this particular instance of someone representing themselves pro se looked like. Before we get into that though, let me thank my partner on today's video, Warby Parker. I think the thing that I get the most compliments on are my glasses, which are Blair frames from Warby Parker. And I've been getting all of my glasses at Warby Parker for years. They're committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. They offer eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, contacts, lenses, okay? But they also have options like blue light filtering lenses, which is what I always get because you guys, we stare at screens too much all day long. It's not natural. And I've noticed that I get fewer headaches now that I've switched over to the blue light filtering lenses. Their glasses start at $95, including the prescription lenses. And you can try Warby Parker's free home try on program where you're able to order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy and the try on glasses ship free and include a prepaid return shipping label. You can try five pairs of glasses at home for free by going to warbyparker.com slash Lija. Now I'm always looking to freshen up my look. So I got a little at home try on kit. This is what it looks like. I'm looking for something bold. 
okay? I don't often go for a black frame, but I'm trying a couple. That's what's cool about the Warby Parker Try-On Kit program is you can try frames that you would not have otherwise necessarily thought would look good on you and you can see for yourself. This is the Winston Wide. They have wide, medium, and narrow options, which I like because I have a very wide face, so I go for the wide. This is uh, a little kooky, but dramatic, kind of fun. I never really go for the black frames, but you know, it's interesting to see who that character version of Legia would be. Another black option, a little nerdier, a little bit uh, librarian-y. I think most of these are librarian-y, but you know, it looks like I read books. Okay, these are the Halton frames. But then I wanted to try something a little bit more neutral. So I tried the Carlton, another wide option, which this is like, if I wore tweed every day, it would look perfect. Then we got the Robbie Narrow. Yep, went for a narrow option just to see how they would look. This is super nerdy, but like, I really like how thin the frames are. It helps with the peripheral vision. And then finally I tried the Fae, which are very similar to what I already have, but a little rounder. Again, fun to just see who is Lija in these glasses and just try them on like a little cosplay moment. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Additionally, for every pair of glasses sold, Warby Parker distributes a pair of glasses to someone in need. Almost a billion people around the world lack access to glasses. This means that 15% of the global population cannot effectively learn or work, which is wild because glasses were invented 700 years ago. Okay, Warby Parker partners with nonprofits like Vision Spring to ensure that for every pair of glasses sold, a pair is distributed to someone in need. So go to warbyparker.com slash Leija to order your home try-on kit for free today. Thanks, Warby Parker. So let me just give you like a rundown of a few of the ridiculous things that Darrell Brooks did during his trial. So like I said, right at the beginning, he started by objecting over personal jurisdiction, saying that the court just doesn't have personal jurisdiction over him because he rejects it. <laughs> but that's not how jurisdiction works. Personal jurisdiction means that the court has the authority to adjudicate an issue over you as a person. You can object to personal jurisdiction if, for example, you've never been to where they're suing you. You didn't do anything wrong in that state. It doesn't make sense for you to be sued there. The thing is, if you enter a state you are availing yourself of that state, of its resources and of its laws, and therefore you are automatically consenting to personal jurisdiction in that state. If you go into Wisconsin and you murder six people, yeah, Wisconsin's gonna have personal jurisdiction over you, all right? You can't just make it go away because you say so. All right, other things he did, frequently he just spoke over the judge, yelled at the judge. He would get mad over details. Like at one point, one of the prosecutors was standing up and handing things out and said the word defendant in kind of a pointed tone, I think because she was trying to raise her voice so that she could be heard by the microphones. And he started yelling about her tone and why she said it the way that she said it to the point that he needed to be removed from the courtroom over just that detail. And the judge would always let him back in after recesses and stuff to give him more chances to behave himself and he would have to then be removed again to another room. And she repeatedly cited to Illinois v. Allen, the Supreme Court case that gives her the authority after repeated warnings to remove him from the proceedings. As an aside, this was the same case that the judge cited frequently during the trial of the Chicago 7. I did a review of the movie version of that, which I really enjoyed. And the difference was that in that trial, the judge was removing one of the defendants after minor interruptions and in a manner that really did interfere with his right to a fair trial. In the case of Darrell Brooks, it was clear that the judge was being very careful to give him every opportunity to behave himself and she was only removing him after giving him many warnings and making it clear on the record that he was being disruptive. She would literally say, I would like to state for the record I have given him multiple warnings and he is now being removed to the other room. The point of this is to make a clear record to show that she was not interfering with his right to a fair trial. She was not removing him for no reason, basically. Because he's likely going to appeal this conviction, probably pro se as well, and that could be grounds for an appeal if she were to have removed him without any reasoning. So having it clear on the record means that there's less likelihood of it being able to be overturned, at least on those grounds. That's not fair to the jury. They they have a right to hear everything. I'm not finna sit here and let you fix fix the trial because you don't want to tell the truth to the jury. 
Mr. Brooks, please stop. No, there ain't no please. You are nothing. being disruptive. Ain't you no are please. being disrespectful. You're always going to find some reason to down. say somebody's being disruptive because they want the truth to be out there. Man, quit it. You're supposed to be Mr. the judge. Mr. Brooks, I'm advising you that continued interruptions will result in you forefitting your right to okay, be present in this court. Under what, under what law in fact can you do that? Illinois versus Allen, Okay, sir. what, the fourth, the fourth uh, option that you made up that's not even in the uh, law? Mr. Because Brooks, you can't do that. I need to make a By ruling. law, you can't do that. I need to make and you a know finding. you can't. All right, I'm going to um, excuse everyone. Mr. Brooks is being removed from the courtroom. He will continue in the neighboring courtroom. Uh, please make sure he has his objection signed. He would also continuously object to questions that the prosecution was asking witnesses, clearly just trying to stall things, just pulling objections out of his butt, things that he'd probably heard on like CSI or Law and Order or whatever. And then when the judge would overrule him because none of his objections were based on any reality, he would then complain under his breath, but you know, loud enough for the whole court to hear. And that's the thing that really kind of gets my goat about these like sovereign citizen type people. It's that they don't follow the rules, even after being given opportunity to have representation or learn the rules. And then they act like they're the victim when they're told, hey, that's not how that works. Him being overruled, despite the fact that his objections are random and not based on anything, appeared to be further confirmation in his mind that he was being unfairly prosecuted. His favorite objection appeared to be objecting for asking a leading question. Like every question the prosecutors asked, he'd be like, objection, leading question, which was never granted because he would object to questions like, did you break your leg? <laughs> which is not a leading question, okay? If you were to ask, you broke your leg, didn't you? That's closer to a leading question because you're telling the witness that the answer that you want them to reach. But he was objecting repeatedly to every question, which made the testimony impossible to get through, especially with one witness during the first week who had to have an interpreter on hand. Proceedings are just generally harder when an interpreter is present. Not to say that interpreters are bad. They're very essential for people who don't speak English to have their voice heard in court and to understand what's happening. Like they're essential to the legal process, but the way that they interpret typically is through continuous or simultaneous interpretation, which means that as one person's talking, the interpreter is interpreting to the person in their ear while it's happening. So you've got the person talking, the interpreter's voice underneath talking to the witness, and then you've got Dorelli Brooks just objecting over top. And we've got court reporters here who are like trying to type out every single word that's said during the trial, and you've got like three people talking all over one another. Absolute chaos. You had torn ligaments? Objection leading. Overrule. You say that in the question before? See. Yes. And were those both in the same leg? Objection leading. Okay. Sorry, yes. over, overruled. If we yeah, of course. just wait when there's an objection, um, I'm overruling it. It's relevant. It's not leading. The witness's answers may stand. I mean, yeah, you overrule every objection. And the jury will disregard the additional commentary made by Mr. Brooks at this time. Additional misconduct at his findings. Did you have to have surgery on that leg? Objection. Leading. Overruled. That's not going to work either. Mr. Brooks, you are advised to stop with the commentary. No, I'm going to say what I want You called this witness. I'm going to take a break right now and excuse the jury and this witness. At another point, at the very beginning of the proceedings, the judge gave Brooks the opportunity to wear a suit and tie or some other street clothes as opposed to his orange prison clothes. And this is really common for judges to do and for defendants to do, to wear a suit and tie in court because it shields the jury from knowing whether or not the defendant is in custody. And it also presents the defendant as like a human with dignity as opposed to a prisoner with a number. And she gave him that opportunity and explained to him why it's important and he refused. But not only did he refuse, he also became belligerent once again and was placed in another room where he proceeded to just take his shirt off <laughs> and walk around. We are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. I need to make a record that at 8.42 a.m. this court ordered Mr. Brooks be removed from the courtroom due to repeated uh, interruptions and disruption uh, with the court. Okay, so clearly this behavior is really bizarre and that coupled with 
the just absolute monstrosity of his crime. It's all things that only someone really unhinged would do, which might make you wonder about issues of competency. Is he competent to represent himself here and how is that determined? Will he have grounds to appeal on that issue? And the judge in this case followed the standard procedure when a defendant decides to proceed pro se. She had a hearing where she was talking to him and talked him through the process and made it abundantly clear the rights that he was giving up when he decided to proceed pro se and made sure that he gave an informed, affirmative answer that he understood the consequences and wanted to proceed without lawyers. Also, competency generally, like if you're competent to stand trial, is a really low bar. It's rare that someone is gonna be found not competent to stand trial. In this case, the question is whether Brooks was competent to waive his constitutional right to an attorney, which is a higher bar because this right is protected by the Sixth Amendment for criminal trials and could have major consequences in the outcome of his case. The standard for determining his competency is that the judge must determine that the waiver is made knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. But that's it. It's not required that the judge deem the defendant's decision to be a prudent one, and a competence determination does not hinge in any way on a demonstration that the defendant has litigation skills at all. It's just whether or not he was aware of the rights he had and the rights that he was foregoing and the consequences of waiving those rights. But again, Judge Dora was really careful. She examined the reports of four different psychologists who found that yes, okay, he has a personality disorder, but that he's intelligent and articulate enough to defend himself. So once again, the judge was very careful in that matter. He seemed to be very aware of what he was doing going forward with the case representing himself. All right, in another instance, he called an ex-girlfriend as a witness and the prosecutors were alleging that he attacked her right before driving his SUV into the parade. But him calling her as a witness was apparent that he was just trying to rehash his relationship with her. And he was going to try to introduce photos and stuff that the prosecution objected to, saying that he was going to try to use them to insinuate that his ex is a bad mom. And there's a rule where on cross-examination, you can only ask questions related to the testimony that was given during direct examination. So the prosecution objected and said that if her character is brought into question, on direct examination by asking her about being a bad mom, then that would open the door for the prosecution to bring in the fact that Durrell had actually slept with her when she was a minor and he was convicted and registered as a sex offender in Nevada for that offense. And their argument would be like, he definitely added to her being a bad mother if she is a bad mother at all. And this is something that otherwise would not have been allowed into the trial. And while they were talking about this, this sent Brooks off the fucking handle. And he was once again, removed from the courtroom. So he was convicted of statutory sexual seduction, pled guilty in March of 2007 to that felony offense and is a sex offender on the registry as a result. So if there's any causation that would lead to Erica Patterson being a bad mom, Mr. Brooks has a direct role in that causation. And that's furthermore, I'll to that I'm not because sure. that's a lie. Let him at finish. The end of the day, let him we, finish. We're gonna open the door on that. No, since he want to make a record and not be accurate, so let's be ac accurate all on the record. Since you think you know so much, once so again, we can Mr. open Brooks the door on. We can open the door on how old she told me she was when we met. We can ask He's, that question he is too. Over the top, animated right now. Do you know that? that? Mr. Brooks, I'm ordering you to sit down and to let the state no, finish. No, no, I'm not going to sit here and let somebody be inaccurate on the record and lie on the record. Right. Under Illinois versus Allen, I've warned him repeatedly. He's being removed from the courtroom. Um, and you know what? Let me dial that back. We're just going to take an early lunch. One hour. We'll be back. And uh, unless he brings that letter Dog and he can show it is inadmissible, you know she will not be questioned. <laughs> and under 90611, I will yeah, declare the cross-examination closed. Know where, you know Thank you, we're in recess, one hour. Time, get your facts straight. So let's, let's open the door on all of it then so we can get all of it on the record. Since you think you know so much, did, did you know she said she was 18 when I met her? Okay, and then just sprinkled throughout the trial, he would just be incredibly disrespectful to the judge in a way that is rare to see anyone act towards a judge. And frankly, her patience was unreal, like truly superhuman throughout all of this. At one point, he was acting so aggressively that she had to call a recess because she felt unsafe. One more interruption and you're gonna be removed to the next courtroom. That's what you wanna do anyway. It's not what I wanna do. Do not interrupt Attorney Opera. 
So can Your you Honor, say, I can believe you he has seven prior criminal convictions. Be a OWI second from 1997, an OWI third from 1997, an OWI fourth from 2003, criminal trespass to dwelling from 2006. All right, I need to take a break. This man right now is having a stare down with me. It's very disrespectful. He pounded his fist, frankly. It makes me scared. Okay, so somehow through all of that, they managed to conclude the trial in part because Brooks became so unresponsive that the judge was forced to have him rest his case early before calling all of his witnesses so that they could like move on to closing arguments because he just wasn't doing anything. The jury only deliberated for a few hours before finding him guilty on all 76 counts against him. And he now faces a mandatory life sentence. Okay, so I went through all of these antics because it's like a train wreck that you can't look away from, but also to outline some of the main challenges that pro se litigants and the judges and courts working with them face pretty regularly. Not at this level, but you know, it's a good example of the extreme end of the spectrum. Pro se litigants don't know the rules of evidence or how to object. They don't know court procedure. And for judges, that could mean needing to hold their hand through the proceedings, which is the judge's duty. But it can also mean dealing with pro se litigants that get angry and belligerent, or at the very least, very flippant about the court's authority. Now listen, I sometimes am a bit flippant about court's authority on this channel. You know, I like to question the Supreme Court. I like to point out that it's not like all judges are unbiased and not swayed by their own personal opinions because that's not how humans work. And I think it's important to talk about that. However, it's not appropriate to do so to a judge's face in court, especially when it compromises your position or the position of your client. Like we can, we can criticize the system all we want, but when you're in court, you can't compromise your client, but also you're not gonna change the system from the inside by being belligerent in court to a judge. You're only gonna make things worse. Okay. It's not like she was going to be like, oh my God, Mr. Brooks, you're right. Now that you put it that way, your constitutional rights are being violated and this entire system is really messed up. Not guilty. Not guilty, Mr. Brooks. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Please, the floor is all yours. I don't know what he was expecting to happen. But while the Brooks trial and his position as a pro se defendant in a criminal trial was highly unusual, the existence of pro se litigants generally is actually very common. The reason that Brooks's case was unusual is that usually pro se litigants aren't defending themselves in a criminal case, especially not one where life in prison is a possible outcome. Because again, the constitution guarantees you a criminal defense lawyer. So criminal defendants are always assigned a public defender if they can't afford their own. So that in itself just cuts way down on the number of pro se litigants defending themselves in criminal court. Because the fact of the matter is that most pro se litigants, whether in criminal court or elsewhere, tend to make less than $30,000 per year. They are low income individuals because if you had a high income, it would be a no brainer to hire a lawyer. But there really isn't good data out there about how many criminal defendants represent themselves, probably because it's so rare. I did find one paper that said that between the years of 1990 and 2000, roughly 0.4% of criminal defendants were self-represented. Where pro se litigants are the most prevalent are in civil cases, so not criminal, civil. In just the federal judiciary alone, so not counting state courts, around 25% of litigants are pro se. They represent themselves. And the type of civil lawsuit most commonly filed by pro se litigants in federal court were prisoner petitions and civil rights cases. From the years 2000 to 2019, 91% of prisoner petition filings were filed by unrepresented litigants. Why? Because they don't have the money, okay? And what does that look like in real terms? I'm talking habeas corpus petitions and complaints about civil rights violations happening inside our prisons. And a habeas corpus petition, in case you're not familiar, it's a civil lawsuit that a prisoner files to say they are wrongfully imprisoned for some reason. It's a lawsuit that's initiated after all other avenues of appeal have been exhausted. So they say, okay, the higher courts all found that I sh still should be in here on the merits, but the conditions of my confinement amount to cruel and unusual punishment, or the sentence is unfairly punitive given the nature of the offense, for example. And then there are other civil rights violations that prisoners bring complaints over. I've seen them against, for example, city officials, police officers in their conduct during an arrest, etc. 
There are also many pro se litigants in family court, which is where I practice. My experience with pro se litigants is especially in the context of orders for protection and restraining orders. It's very common for the litigants in those cases to not have the funds to hire an attorney. And my experience with pro se litigants has really run the gamut from very respectful, self-represented people to people who overtly flout the court rules to the point of being like pointedly disrespectful to the judge to also lawsuits that are so frivolous that they don't even make it past stage one. And that's a great illustration of the conundrum of pro se litigants. They're often really low income, like I said, because you're less likely to proceed pro se if you have the funds to hire an attorney, but you still deserve to have your voice heard in court even if you don't have the money to hire a lawyer. And many pro se litigants are prisoners. Don't even get me started on our prison industrial complex in this country, on the abuses that happen in there, the racist elements of our criminal justice system and how it allows for forced labor behind closed doors. Okay, I don't know about you, but I want people in the prison system to be able to have recourse and have their voices heard in court. It's literally the lowest bar. Okay, that being said, however, allowing for pro se litigation means that anyone can file lawsuits. There are a lot of people out there who are a little unhinged, okay? Anyone can abuse the system and file frivolous or retaliatory lawsuits. Like I said, our educational system in this country leaves people pretty illiterate when it comes to the law. So people have no idea how to navigate the laws or the legal system. So they tend to gunk up the courts and use up vital court resources when bringing pro se cases. There are courts who have cl judicial clerks specifically assigned to handling pro se litigants because of the amount of time that it takes to handle them. The reason they take so much time is because it's a generally accepted practice that deference should be given to pro se litigants in order for them to get a fair shot in court as fair as someone who's represented by a lawyer. What that means in practice is that, okay, the pro se litigant files a complaint, but they didn't do it right. Maybe they didn't articulate the law right. Maybe they missed some steps, but the courts will often take their filings and their arguments and say, okay, I think your argument relates to this law and I think you're saying this, this, and this. Basically giving them the benefit of the doubt. And that takes a lot of time. When I was a judicial intern, I was assigned these cases because it was like, oh my God, thank God we have free labor. Please try to decipher what this guy is saying. Especially because with things like pro se habeas corpus petitions, filed by people who are in prison, they're often handwritten by people with varying levels of education who are just trying to be heard. So sometimes literally reading what they've written takes extra time. It's a huge suck of court resources. And that's made even worse when a pro se litigant's claims are meritless and they're just filing the lawsuit to like get back at someone or because they feel they were wronged in some way, but there's no law or right of theirs that was actually infringed upon. Filing lawsuits and restraining orders is also a common way for abusive partners to further antagonize their victims, even after the victim has left the situation. So you see what I mean? Like pro se litigants are a really tricky subject and there's no real good answer because on the one hand, you want people to have access to the court system, even if they don't have the money to hire an attorney. And I am very pro that, but also I have seen it from the inside and how absolutely frustrating it is for victims of abuse, for city officials who are getting like these frivolous lawsuits filed against them by sovereign citizens or whoever who are just mad and trying to gunk up the system. How do you balance that? Okay, there's not really a great answer or there's not a great answer that's not gonna cost a lot of money. And because these issues are so tricky, numerous legal commentators have come forward to call out courts for their treatment of pro se litigants because courts tend to dismiss pro se litigants. They think they're stupid or frivolous or a waste of everyone's time. Even Richard Posner, one of the most preeminent legal scholars alive today, he abruptly resigned from the Seventh Circuit Court in 2017, in part over his disagreement with his court colleagues over the Seventh Circuit's treatment of pro se litigants. He said that he thought the court wasn't treating pro se litigants fairly and that they didn't like pro se litigants and generally didn't want anything to do with them. Okay, so this is happening at really every level of our judicial system. And reforms have been made or attempted at both the federal and state level, though not 
evenly across the board. These reforms include things like providing pro se litigants methods for more easily filing lawsuits and monitoring proceedings, like through digital filing systems, letting pro se litigants communicate directly with law clerks about their claims, and publicly disseminating information about resources that are available to pro se litigants. However, a paper that I found that was published in the University of Chicago Law Review shows that thus far, a wide range of reforms undertaken by federal district courts have not significantly impacted case outcomes for pro se litigants. Meaning even with all of these resources, pro se litigants still aren't winning more of their cases or being more successful in representing themselves. And the paper concludes that it is also possible that there is no cost effective way to improve case outcomes for civil pro se litigants in the context of the modern US legal system. The way our system is set up, its complexities, the many hoops you have to jump through, the way that the prison system is set up, access to justice, access to the funds in order to support the system, to help pro se litigants, it's just not there. And in this context, there's not really a way to reform it in an effective way that's going to allow legitimate pro se claims to be more successful and kind of weed out the frivolous claims. And this, my friend, is just another example of the frustrating complexities of our legal system, where there is no right answer. There's no silver bullet, and there's no clear right or wrong way to go about it. I feel like becoming a lawyer, going to law school, even just gaining knowledge of the law requires you to kind of be okay with existing in this uncomfortable gray area where there are arguments on both sides. And the person who typically always loses in these cases is the poor person who has meritorious claims that has to represent themselves in all of this mess. Brooks, however, was not that person, okay? He had lawyers, he fired them anyway, he made that choice knowingly. That's not to say that necessarily his lawyers that were assigned to him were great. There are many public defenders who are not great, though there are many, many public defenders who are great, okay? There's a book called Just Mercy, I highly recommend you read, which is all about the prison system and people being poorly served by public defenders. But Brooks' situation is a very different situation than someone being wrongfully held in solitary confinement and needing to file a petition for relief. You know what I mean? Very different things, but they all fall under the umbrella of pro se representation. And it's a mess. That's the moral of the story. I don't have a tidy bow to tie around this for you. I don't have a final thesis statement. It's a mess. Thanks again to my partner on today's video, Warby Parker. Go to warbyparker.com slash Legia to order your home try-on kit for free today. If you enjoyed this and want to support my work bringing you videos like this, please consider becoming a member of this channel or joining me over on Patreon, where we have a lively Discord chat, Legia's book club, behind the scenes stuff, and so much more. Thank you especially to newest Patreon supporters, Helen Hunt on Wheels, Travis Willette, Nathan, and Tay. And as always, thank you to my royal patrons, Old Man Pence, Fork McSpoon, L, &L Daniel Taylor and Lita, and a very special thank you to my multi-platinum patrons, Brett Piantek and Cyrus Solka. Your generosity is greatly appreciated and it makes this channel what it is today, so thank you. If you liked this video, you might also like this video looking at how the filibuster became a tool for racists. Thanks so much for watching, have a good day, Bye bye